Good morning, guys. Uh, it's great to be here, and it's a real privilege to be sharing uh, God's Word with you. I want to speak this morning on sonship, on being sons, and uh, I want to talk about what it means to, 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 to be sons, and I'll explain that in a moment, and what that looks like in our lives. And uh, I'm really trusting that God is going to continue. He's already ministering. He's already been doing work in hearts, and that that ministry continues this morning. You see, when we give our lives over to following Jesus, we become, what the Bible says, born again. We become children of God, and the Bible calls us sons. Whether you are male or female, all right, the Bible calls us sons because we inherit the the full inheritance of what the Father has for us. The full inheritance of his promises. In Galatians 3, it says, There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs, heirs, according to his promise. The Bible calls us co-heirs with Christ. And so, ladies, this morning, I'm going to be talking about us as sons because we are all heirs according to the promises of, uh, of God. We all inherit the fullness of what God has for us. A little bit like when we talk about the bride of Christ, us men have to get, wrap that around our, our heads because we're all part of the bride. Amen? So just to clarify that as we, as we go ahead. And, and this understanding of, of ourselves as, as his children, as his sons, is crucial. The, the degree to which we understand ourselves as sons loved by the Father is a degree to which it determines how we walk, how we think, how we speak, how we act, how we relate to others. And the reality is that in our everyday lives, many of us, we haven't fully got that understanding. We're still growing and maturing in our understanding of what it means to be a son receiving his undeserved grace, his undeserved forgiveness, brought into the family of God, adopted uh, as his children. We're still grasping that. And maturity is learning to, to, to grow in that understanding and walk in that understanding. And that's really what I want to go after this morning. You see, the devil wants to do his utmost to confuse us about our identity as, as sons, as children of God. He wants to throw us off course. He wants, to, he, he wants to bring lies and fears and so on. But the more we get this understanding of who we are in Christ, of who we, of, of who we are as sons, inheriting the fullness of what God has for us, the, the more we are able to walk in freedom. Well, the more we're able to um, under, um, walk in a place of identity, security, and belonging. So that's what I want to go after this morning, and um, to help us, we're going to look at the story of David and Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel chapter 9, so you can turn there in a moment, or you can turn there now, and we'll get there in a moment, but this thing of, 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 of walking and living and maturing as in our understanding of sons, something that I've really been grappling with, and I found myself catching myself in the last couple of weeks, and thinking, this thought pattern that I'm going down, that's not how sons think. That's not how children of God think. That's not how we should be thinking. This, the way that I've just treated, if I've treated Bron poorly, that, that's not how children of God, believers, followers of Jesus, sons, behave. So I've been catching myself and just... just Everything that I've been doing and saying and thinking, putting it through the filter of being a son, being a child of God. And uh, it's been quite liberating. So just to give you a little bit of background uh, before we get to the story of David and Mephibosheth. So David is now, in 2 Samuel 9, David, David is now king of Israel. Saul was the previous king of Israel. We know that there was this fierce jealousy between Saul and David because David rose to fame very quickly. He killed Goliath. He, he was a, a mighty army, a mighty warrior in, in Saul's army. And uh, there was this rift between the followers of Saul and this follow, the followers of David and this fierce jealousy. 
And Saul did everything he could to try and pursue David to, to, to kill him, to wipe him out because he saw him as a threat. And we know that the prophet Samuel went and he found David and he, he anointed David to be the next king of, king of Israel. But um, Saul, Saul's son, Jonathan, we know that Jonathan and David became tight. They, they became close friends, so much so that they made a covenant together. And Jonathan showed incredible kindness towards David, even though Jonathan would have thought, okay, he's the next, he's next in line to the throne, and yet he, he somehow must have known that, that David had been anointed to be king of Israel and that he did, needed to do everything that he could to show kindness, to protect him. And because of this friendship that they had, he protected him from, the, from, from, from King Saul and from the anger of King Saul and so on. And so... Saul and Jonathan, I'm, I'm summarizing over a whole lot of chapters now just so that we can get to the, the main points, but Saul and Jonathan were killed in battle by the Philistines, and uh, to cut a long story short, David becomes the next king of Israel. And so we fast forward to 2 Samuel chapter 9, and what I'm going to do, we're going to read some verses, and then we're going to stop, and I'm going to give you three characteristics of sons this morning. Three things of, or, or character traits of what it looks like to walk as a son, as a child of God, adopted into his family this morning. Is that all right? Anyone there? All right. Great. So let's start. We're going to read uh, verse one, and then we're going to stop for a minute. Okay. So and David said, so yeah, he, yeah, he is he's king of Israel, and everything is going well. The kingdom is flourishing. David is being a good king. They've, uh, Israel have won uh, many battles against opposing, opposing armies, and he's sitting on his throne one day, and he says this in verse 1, 2, cha 2 Samuel chapter 9. And David said, is there still anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And so the first characteristic of sons, of children of God, is that sons are treasure hunters. Sons are treasure hunters. I'll explain this in a moment. But this is an incredible verse because you must understand the culture uh, in that day with kings and kingdoms was that if, if a new guy becomes king, he's Generally speaking, the pattern was to look for anyone that was part of the previous king's lineage or line and basically wipe them out so that his kingdom, his throne could be established. All right? So, yeah, David is saying, is there anyone in Saul's line? And you can just imagine the guys listening to him thinking, oh, boy, <laughs> here goes, you know? And, and he says, but he wants to show kindness for Jonathan's sake. And so, because of the kindness that Jonathan had showed him, because of the covenant, and part of that covenant that they had made was that David promised that he would show kindness to Jonathan's family in the years to come. And so he's looking, and he's trying to find uh, anyone that he can show kindness towards. And so he's going completely against the culture completely counterculture, completely against the pattern of the day. He was once a hunted, but now he's hunting for treasure. You see, in our culture, the hunt is on, often for fault finding, for criticism, for giving others what they, do, what they, what they deserve, for... giving people a cold shoulder if you, if, you, if you get hurt, silent treatment, or just out, outright reaction or rage or anger. And in extreme cases, people get gunned down because people are just angry. And we've seen that, we've witnessed that in our own community here in Port Shepson, where an attempt to solve problems is just to wipe people out. And as sons, it, even on social media, we see that. People wanting to just take cheap shots at others 
with words, gunning people down in words, with words. And as sons, we're called to respond differently as his children, as followers of, of Christ. The Bible says don't conform to the pattern of the world. Don't do what everyone else does, but be renewed, but, uh, be, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so in the same way that David wanted to show kindness to Saul's family, the Father has showed us undeserved kindness through Christ, through the cross. In uh, Ephesians 2 verse 7 it says, So that in the coming ages he, meaning God, might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And because of what Christ did, the Father extends or lavishes, pours out his undeserved grace and favor on us. You see, outside of Christ, outside of Christ, we, we, are, we are God's enemies. Outside of Christ, we are enemies of God. In Christ, we are brought into his families, into his family as sons. Amen? So as treasure hunters, we get to look for ways to extend grace and kindness towards people. And it's so much more powerful when that kindness is undeserved or unexpected. And a great example of that was in the World Cup. Towards the end of the Rugby World Cup, there was this controversy where one of our players allegedly called one of the English players a derogatory name, and there was this controversy afterwards. There was a lot of backwards and forwards on social media. And there was quite a lot of abuse hurled by South Africans towards the English player. And what um, Sia Khaleesi, our captain, did, he came out in support, not taking sides, but just sent a message to the English player, unexpected, to say, hey, we're thinking of you. We know what it's like to be public figures. We know what it's like when abuse is hurled on us. We know what it's like when we're, uh, for our families, and we're thinking of you. And that reaction from Sia was unexpected, but it was powerful, and it got such an incredible response. And you and I, because of the kindness that God has showed us, we get to show kindness towards people. We get to look for treasure. Why don't we wake up? Yeah, it's a good thing to do. Wake up in the morning and say, is there anyone I can show kindness towards? Is there any treasure I can find in people that I can look for? If I, if I look at Dane, it's not hard to find treasure in Dane. All right? I'm serious. So I look for, I look for treasure in Dane. I can identify it. I say, Dan loves the Lord passionately, and he loves people passionately, and he, and he shows that ex exceptionally well. So I look for it, identify it, and then I can communicate it. Dan, you're awesome. I love the way you, you're passionate about God. I love the way you're passionate about people. I love your, your, the way you, 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 you make everyone feel like you, they're your friend. That's treasure right there. Let's be treasure hunters rather than false finders. Amen? Right, moving on. The story continues, and um, Ziba was one of Saul's servants. He is brought to, to King David, and David asks him again, is there anyone from Saul's line? And Ziba tells David about this guy, Mephibosheth. I, I've practiced it lots, so I can say it well. All right? And uh, I'll probably butcher it at some point, but <laughs> Mephibosheth was Jonathan's son. And what happened was when he was a baby, um, his nursemaid, when she heard about Jonathan and Saul being killed in battle, she fled in fear of David and dropped Mephibosheth, and he was crippled and lame instantly. And Ziba says, yeah, there's, there's Mephibosheth, he's Jonathan's son, but he's, he's lame. He couldn't say it fast enough. It was, as I read that, he, he was like, he's lame. In, I don't know if you're really going to want him because he was lame in both feet. 
And it's almost like David overlooked that. He just said, bring him. I want him. Let him come. And we read from verse 6 to 8. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. And David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid. And David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? What a beautiful picture. What a beautiful story. Mephibosheth, seemingly undeserving, part of Saul's line. And David says, come, you're going to be like one of my own. You, I'm going to give you everything, the full inheritance that belongs to you. I'm going to give it to you, and you're going to come and sit at my table. Characteristic number two, sons live free of fear. Quite a lot has been said about fear this morning. Sons live free of fear. It would seem that Mephibosheth was fearful because David said, do not fear. <laughs> it would seem that he was fearful. And, he, and in that culture, he would have had two very good reasons to be fearful in the king's presence. Number one, he was part of Saul's line, the enemy's line, and a potential threat to David's throne. All right? So his position, because of his position, he would have had a very good reason to fear David. And then secondly, his condition was definitely not favorable. If you were lame, if you were crippled, you were seen as useless, not, not being able to do anything, not being able to contribute to the economy in any way, and uh, there was shame attached to that. In fact, Mephibosheth, the word Mephibosheth means out of the mouth of shame. And so because of his position, because of his condition, he would have had reason to fear. And the Bible says that he lived out in a place called Lodabar, which means place of barrenness. There he was, far away, hiding from David. And in that place, fear would have, in that place of barrenness, in that wilderness, fear would have grown in his heart. And, you know, fear is a big deal in, in, uh, in, our, in our society, in our culture, in our environment. We are faced with it, and we have to deal with it um, and allow God to deal with it in our lives on a daily basis. Fear of lack, fear of danger, fear of theft, fear of death, and then fears in our mind, fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of not measuring up, and I can go on and on and on. Let's just take fear of failure as an example. The week before last, um, as a staff, yeah, in the, in the building, we were running around quite a bit trying to solve issues, um, power issues, electrical issues. There was lightning, and so it messed with our, some of our technology. And so we were working quite hard, spending quite a lot of time phoning people, finding out, ordering new things, trying to troubleshoot. Come to last week's service, and you'll remember we had issues. <laughs> power tripping, and so on. And if I'm honest, I'm going to be a little vulnerable with you. I can't speak for the other staff, but if I'm honest, there was temptation for me to feel a little bit like a failure. Like, we've gone to all this trouble. We're going to have hundreds of people, and now, look what's happened. There was temptation to feel like a failure. But the thing is, with, with, with fear of failure, it's a performance driven fear. It's a performance, we, we end up evaluating ourselves or judging ourselves based on, based on our performance, our condition rather than our position as sons. And you see, Mephibosheth judged himself on his position as, as, as David's enemy and on his condition, his performance or lack thereof because of his lameness. But when we understand that we are sons, that our position as sons has got nothing to do with our performance. It's got nothing to do with, 
with, with our lameness, with our crippledness. It's got everything to do with the Father's love. It's got everything to do what, for, um, with what Christ did for us at the cross. Everything. That's beautiful. And that sets us free. And at the end, we're going to have some ministry time already trusting God to set people free from fear this morning. Amen. Parents, do everything you can to make sure your, par- your kids know that they are loved, not because of what they do, not because of their condition, not because of their performance, but because of their position in the family as sons and daughters. Make sure that they are not performance-driven to try and get your, your approval. And that creeps in. But we have to do everything we can to say, my son, my daughter, I love you regardless. You're loved. Finish and claw. Yes, we, um, stuff, um, mistakes have consequences, yes. But that doesn't change my love for you. All right, moving on. Story continues. David tells Ziba what he's decided to do, that he's inviting uh, um, Mephibosheth to eat at his table, that he's restoring everything to him, and he gives Ziba instructions. And we read from verse 11, and then we're going to get to our third characteristic. Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always, he always ate at the king's table. And then there's a little detail at the end. He was lame in both feet. It's almost like it was immaterial. It didn't really matter. You see, when he, Mephibosheth sat at the king's table, his legs, his lameness went under the table. The table, David's table, covered his shame. It covered the lameness. And uh, this is a beautiful picture of the Father, of Jesus, and of us as Mephibosheths. Because of what Christ did at the cross, he took your sin my sin, your shame, my shame upon himself at the cross. And the Father has covered our lameness, our crippledness, and made us undeservedly, it's an incredible story, it's an incredible truth, undeservedly made us his his very own to eat at his table, to be in fellowship with him, to be in relationship with him. This is the gospel. The gospel is powerful. It's a, it changes our lives, and when we speak it into people's lives, it changes people. Amen. Anyone excited about the gospel? <laughs> All right. Characteristic number three. And we're going to close with the sons forgive completely. Sons forgive completely. And I just want to say this. If... Just because maybe you've got fear and just because you've got some unforgiveness and just because maybe you haven't been showing kindness, that doesn't mean you're not sons. That's not what I'm saying. All right? But we, I'm, what I'm trying to do is show us what, what this thing of being sons looks like, how it, how it has its working, its outworking in our, in our lives. Amen? Is that clear? So sons forgive completely. You see, David forgave, would have had to forgive Saul's, um, Saul's descendants completely. To be able to show such incredible kindness, incredible grace towards Mephibosheth, he would have had to forgive 100%. 70 times 7, as Jesus uh, spoke about. You see, unforgiveness is another serious hindrance to us walking in the fullness and the freedom that God has, intends for us as sons. Unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment. And we see how that thing can cause rifts in families so easily. 
I spoke to somebody a while back, an elderly person, and the person said to me, tragically, I've never told anybody about this before. Elderly person, lived for years, for decades, with, and the story that this person told me was one of horrible abuse. And the tragedy is what happens with unforgiveness many times is that we hide it under the table. We hide it under the table. We we keep it hidden because we don't want to, we we, we want to, and and, and we want to go over and over and over and over uh, the incident in our mind. Sometimes it can be a small little word, a small little act, and it grows as we relive that incident over and over and over until it is something big. And then there are obviously other times where there's something massive that happens, some, some form of abuse. But if we harbor, if we keep that in, if we hide it under the table, it makes us sick in our souls and even in our bodies. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It really is. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you're walking with bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness towards somebody or or people, I want to encourage you to go to the Lord, to give it to Him. Maybe you need to walk go through some counseling and and, and, and walk a road with somebody to help you because in some cases, unforgiveness has layers. It has babies. And we have to deal with those layers. And it takes time. But by the power of God, working in our lives and through our lives, we can forgive. And the, the beautiful thing is, as sons, the Bible says in Colossians that Jesus forgave us, that he canceled the debt of our sin that was upon us. He canceled it. And so because of that, we can, we can forgive freely. Because of that, we get to walk in, sons get to walk in forgiveness. And the more we harbor that stuff, the, 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 the more it cripples us. In uh, Ephesians 4, it says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Forgive. Forgive quickly. Let it go. Deal with it. Because we are the forgiven. We are ones that have been forgiven and set free because of the cross. Amen. So as I close... Maybe this morning, you've got some business to do with the Lord. I wonder if the band can come up. Maybe you've got some business to do with the Lord this morning. Maybe there's some people that you need to forgive. Maybe there's some fears that that you want the Lord to deal with. Maybe there's some, you realize there's some treating of people that that hasn't been okay. And repentance is a beautiful thing because we literally turn from the way that we've, we've been walking, we turn and we change our way of thinking and we change our way of acting and we say, I'm going I'm to do, do things differently from now on. I wonder if we can stand. If you feel like God has been speaking to you this morning and you would like, and you would like prayer in any of the things that, that, that we've been talking about this morning, maybe even during the, during the worship time. Why don't you just come forward? Just come forward. If the ministry team could come, come forward as well. And uh, don't pass up this opportunity. We, we have an opportunity right now to respond to the Word of God, to respond to what God has been speaking to us about, to what He's been saying. And if you don't know Jesus... You've never given your life to Him. You've never surrendered your life. And you could say, I don't know if I am a son. I don't know if I've actually made that commitment. And you would like to do that this morning. Why don't please, please come to the, to the front.
Don't hesitate. Don't, don't leave it. And Father, we thank you. Just as I pray, if you, if you want to come to the front, just, just, just come forward. Let's have eyes closed so that it's not, people don't feel exposed. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us. You've, uh, you have adopted us into your family as your children. Help us, Lord, in our understanding. Help us to mature and to grow as sons in our understanding of who we are in you and what it is you've done for us, Lord God. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be treasure hunters, to hunt down treasure in people, Lord God. Hunt down acts of kindness. Help us this morning, Lord God, to walk free of fear. Father, I just declare freedom over fear in the name of Jesus in people's lives. Over every form of fear, I just declare freedom in the name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you for freedom from bitterness, from rage, from offense, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I just had a, I just felt earlier on that there's, there, there's somebody, or maybe it's more than one person. You feel like you, you've made an inner vow, an inner promise in your, in your heart that you're never going to love again. And it might be in any kind of context, might be even never going to love the Lord or I'm, I'm never going to love again. I'm never going to be allow myself to be loved again. And normally that comes from some sort of hurt, some sort of trauma, some sort of bad experience. I want to pray for you. If you want to come to the front, you can do that. But I want to pray, Father, would you just bring healing from past those past hurts, those past traumas, and I pray for those, that person or those people, Lord, that you, would, that you would restore to them that understanding of being loved and the ability to love again, Lord God. And we cancel in the name of Jesus that inner vow, that inner promise. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.